Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets, your host, Jeff Lerner. Excited to be here with you as always. I am joined today by the very young but very talented Trevor Oldham. And he's like, probably like, don't don't say I'm very young. It's all relative. And I'm thinking, yeah, actually, that's true. Me calling you very young just makes me sound very old. So maybe I I retract that. But anyway, (laughs) I'm rambling. Trevor, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Thank you, Jeff. Excited to be here today. Yeah, we're glad you're here. I hope the signal's okay. I hope the sound's okay. I hope the connection's okay. I'm on. Uh, I'm, I'm in a hotel right now. This is not my my house. Um, I'm in Vegas, and uh, but you know that's the beautiful thing about what we do as digital entrepreneurs. Just pack up these little mics and computers and take your whole business with you, right? Exactly. Um, so speaking of, you have a business related to podcasting, but it's not a podcast. You used to have a podcast, but now you help other people with their podcasts, which frankly, I think sounds genius because as a podcaster, uh, I can attest podcasting is tough business and you need a lot of help. Um, so t- tell me a little bit about that. Tell me, tell me about podcast you and kind of what you guys do for people. Sure. So podcasting you. So I found that there was a need in the marketplace for people that wanted to go out there and get booked on podcasts, similar to if they were going out there and getting booked on a stage and they're speaking to an audience of 500 or a thousand people. But instead of speaking to that audience, they're able to go on like Jeff, you and I today, uh, a 45 minute interview where they're able to capture that in about three years ago. I started podcasting you and I found that people really just want to go out there and get on podcasts. And it's especially prevalent that with now during the pandemic where basically you could look at all the speaking engagements that were structured are basically going to be canceled through the rest of the year. So people are really finding value in podcasts. And I think they find that podcasting specifically where they're able to talk to a host one-on-one like you and I, Jeff, and then that audio will go out to your audience. It's going to be more beneficial than if I go and post it on say Instagram, where people generally go on Instagram, they'll, they'll scroll through and then that'll be done where podcasting people are finding that it's a great strategy for PR generally people that listen to podcasts are going to have a higher income than generally people that are on social media plus you can create great content so are taking that all of our all of that in our company really works with individuals to go out there and then get them booked on podcasts sort of like a PR company but it was honestly it was something I never expected it was more just something that I kind of just found myself in and then found out that people like the service. I found out that I was good at it. I saw the value in it and it's kind of just really grown over the last three years or so. Yeah. I mean, I, I gotta say, and, and when I saw that, that you were going to be on the show, uh, I was really excited because this is something I, I could not believe more in as far as the value, you know, I've now had uh, this show millionaire secrets. I don't guess we've been doing this like four months, four or five months. And so it's a young show. I've gotten a lot of guests on here. I've started to go on to other shows, but like I have a team, you know, this is something I do as a part of a much larger business. And so I have people that get me guests. I have someone that gets me on other shows. I have other people that do the graphics and other people do the editing. And like, I'm super fortunate that I was able to go from like zero to podcast pretty quickly because I have a lot of help. But for the average person who wants to start a podcast, it seemed, or or who wants to get out and leverage the podcast format to get their their message out on other people's podcasts, it seems really hard (laughs) because it's hard for me and I have so much more to work with, I know, than most people getting started. So like, like, what do you say to somebody who comes to you and is like, hey, I've got a message or a passion or a mission or a service record or like, I, I, you know, I know I can help. I know I have something to offer, but like, 
I don't know how to break through and get it out to the world with this platform. Like, what do you say to that person? Uh, not just from a service offering, but just from a, a consultative and a, a brand and business development perspective. Like, how do people do that? I think the biggest thing is just what is your story? What value do you have to offer to the world? And I think that's really honing in on your target audience because we find that a lot of people that I consider themselves like myself, I'm an entrepreneur, but there's, you know, thousands of entrepreneur shows that are out there. So you really want to hone in on who your target audience is and who you want to speak to. Because if I go out there and I speak to entrepreneurs who want to start a brick and mortar business, it, the message is just not going to resonate because my business is 100% online. My, my team is fully remote. So really it's honing in on that audience. And then from there, it's just starting small. And you'll find a lot of people that want to get booked on podcasts to share their message and story. They'll come to us and say, I want to get on the Joe Rogan show right away. Well, you know, that would be nice. But if you've never been on a podcast, one, you know, that's probably one of the top podcasts that are out there. And two, you're probably going to sound like a fool if you go on a podcast without having done any interviews. And we like to use a strategy with individuals that have never been on a podcast where it's basically you start small, go on smaller podcasts, podcasts that have been released, say, in the last three months or so. Once you get your ground footing on there, then you want to go to medium sized podcasts, you know, been around a year or so. And then you can go to large podcasts, you know, there's going to be more of your household names podcasts. And just going to be almost like a piggyback strategy. And that really works for individuals because I find that if you were to go on a top tier podcast in your industry and you've never been on a podcast before and you get interviewed, there's a good chance you're going to make yourself sound like a fool. You're not going to have your story down. So really just starting small and it's a strategy, you know, you can't expect to go on one podcast and you're going to gain thousands of email subscribers. You're going to get tons of people to sign up for your product. It's really a strategy that's more for the long term. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally can vouch for that, for everything you just said. I've been on, you know, several, probably a couple dozen podcasts now in the last, you know, four or five months since I started doing this. A lot of it's been reciprocity for having people on my podcast, which, you know, is probably a whole other conversation. If you want to be on podcasts, start a podcast, and then people are more likely to have you on theirs when you have them on yours. But that's a whole, you know, that's probably not for everyone. But regardless, I will, I will vouch for what you just said, which is like you go on a big podcast. Like I was on, um, what's a good example? Like Dropping Bombs with Bradley, for example. <laughs> it's like a pretty good, you know, I don't know where that ranks on the, the tiers of podcasts, but like, you know, it's, it's probably at least like a B level wise mm -hmm. in terms of audience. Um, he's got a really high quality. He's probably like A quality, B size. I don't know, but. Um, here's what I can say, just using that one as an example. I went on the podcast. It wasn't my first. If it was, I would have been totally intimidated because you like, I had to go to Vegas. I went in his booth. He's got guys. You're, there's like people standing around you filming and recording and doing sound effects. And there's literally, it sounds like bombs are dropping because it's called dropping bombs, you know? And so, yeah, it would have been, it, I can see that's not where somebody should start if they've never been interviewed before, but also that's a great example of what you're talking about where it's not like, I mean, I think I gained like 400 Instagram followers if I try to actually measure it, you know, cause he put a, he put a clip out on IGTV and then he obviously released the full episode and, you know, I saw a little spike I think I can attribute, but it's, it's the people that listen to podcasts, like to your point. So for example, this morning I got contacted by a financial institution that specifically does growth oriented lending for digital companies. And I have a call next week to potentially line up a line of credit to help me continue scaling my business without draining as much cash. Like that's a really valuable thing for me. And I know the organization, they're a pretty big uh, bank out of, out of San Francisco that does this. But if I had been calling that bank trying to get through and get onto their radar, who knows if I ever would have gotten there. I could have made a bunch of phone calls. I could have wasted a bunch of time, but it just so happened that one of their guys was listening to that podcast. So now he's emailing me like, Hey Jeff, let's talk. And it just, that's the, it's not so much the quantity it's the quality is, is my point, you know, and I've had other people now I've, I've been invited to be, cause another thing is people who have podcasts, listen to podcasts. So you go on a podcast, do a good job there's a decent chance that someone else is going to reach out if you're a good guest and say, Hey, come on my podcast. Yeah, that was great. Cause I know as a podcast host, you're constantly looking for good guests, right? So how do you, how do you coach someone on being a good guest, being the kind of guest where they're going to do themselves a favor to, to be on one show 
and do well enough that it could likely lead to them being on another. I think the biggest strategy one is just, we say like the A to B story. What's the rags to riches story? <laughs> Everyone loves that story where you can say, I got started as a, you know, I was working in a corporate job nine to five and I became a successful real estate investor achieving financial freedom. This is how I did it, it you know, going from A to B. And we find that when they share that story, it really resonates with an audience. And then again, it just goes back to those smaller shows and just trying your story out with that. I can tell you, you know, Jeff, I'm sure when you went into podcast, when I started going on to podcast and guesting, you know, my story differed a couple of times till I really got it down and found yeah. what resonated, found what the audience like. So it's one of those things that's just, it's just trial and error. And I think sometimes people can be like, oh, well, this podcast only has five episodes. Well, I'm like, that's the perfect amount of episodes for you to go out there and then try your interviews out, make sure that you become comfortable because I think just human nature that you're going to be anxious if you've never done a podcast interview before. It's something that's new. You know, you're, you have your mic on. You don't know if it's exactly working. You don't know how the sound quality is going. You know, there's going to be a million things going through your mind and you don't want that happening if you go on a larger show. So just starting on that small show and then getting that story of A to B down. Yeah, that's so true. Um, you talk about the reps crafting your story. You know, it was a big, it was a big shift for me to start thinking of myself, not as like this complex, neurotic human being who's this constant swirl of emotions and chaos because we're just humans and we're messy, but to be like, no, I am a commercial asset. I have a brand, I have a storyline, I have a USP, and I need to start to think of myself the way like Nabisco thinks of a cookie. How do we package it? How do we colorize it? How do we texture it? How do we sweeten it? How do we, it doesn't, you, you know what I mean? Like you're still, you're still you, but you have to start thinking in terms of how the market views you. And they're not nearly as interested in all the things that make you, you as you are. Right. Exactly. And, and, and it takes a lot of reps to find that, find what the cookie needs to look, taste and feel like. Right. Exactly. And you can think of, you know, going on, on podcast guessing, it's almost like you're building a personal brand that if you are unique in your own market and you go out there and whatever market and you talk about, you know, that, that certain topic on all these podcasts, you know, I'm assuming if someone listens, I listen to the real estate as an example, if someone listens to one real estate show, I'm sure they listen to, you know, potentially two or other, three other real estate shows and they find you on those shows, you know, sharing your advice, they're like, Oh, you know, maybe this guy's an expert. And if that's something that they need, then they would turn to you. So, you know, I think that's a good strategy as well as it comes into building that personal brand. And the more shows they, that you get on, the more you're going to be sort of looking nice within that space. And I know for me, you know, finding entrepreneurs who I look up to and reading their books, you know, if I see that they've been on multiple podcasts that I listen to, then I'm like, well, I'm going to be more apt to go check them out, especially if it's within that same niche. Yeah, it is. It's such a, and it is, it's like such an art to, in, in a, in a, a mental bridge or a mental gap you have to bridge of like, I have to start being objective about myself and I have to start being like my own marketing agent where a lot of it is addition by subtraction. It's like, what's the 99% of the crap that's very real and very important to me because it's my life that I'm going to remove from the equation so that I leave the 1% of me that's actually the interesting tar like focused, targeted, story-based quote truth that is going to help me advance my career. It's going to help the podcaster grow their pot. That, Cause you got to think like you're not there for them to help you. You're there. You, you, it's got to feel like you're helping each other. Right. And so you need to bring great value to their podcast, which means understanding their audience and that their audience is only going to listen to a boring rambling, unfocused, unclear guest for about four seconds before they go, oh, this is a crap episode. I'm going to go listen to another podcast. And here's the thing, that doesn't hurt you. That hurts your host. You, oh, you just cost exactly. them a listener. You, you didn't have the listener. They did. And you just cost them the listener. So, so don't even want to be on their show until you know that you're going to be a, a value add for them to have you on, right? Exactly. And, you know, I think that again goes back to, you know, the small, medium and large shows. If you're just starting out and let's say you're a year removed, but you still have value to that you can provide to an audience. But if you want to go on a show that's, you know, let's say for experts that's been around for 10 years, you know, you, you probably don't want to go on that show. So I think it's really just staying within your bounds and then just growing over time. I can tell you in the beginning, you know, when I was first starting going on podcasts, 
after about, it's funny, after about three years of getting people booked on podcasts through my company, I decided, you know, maybe it's time that I actually go out there and get myself booked on some of these podcasts, you know, and that was a little uncomfortable for me being like a natural introvert, but I realized that I don't want to go out there and start with these larger shows. I just want to start within my bounds. And then just over time, you just grow. And it's like anything else as an entrepreneur, you could look back at your first year and you'd be like, wow, I'm, I'm such an idiot. You know, why did I do that within my business? And I think it's just like anything else, you know, over time, it just becomes more comfortable. And as you mentioned, just doing that repetition, 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 that's what's really going to allow you to grow. So, so back up then, like you're obviously you're, I mean, you, you, I think, are you 23? Yep, 23. Okay, I can quit talking about it in the abstract. You're 23 years old. Young, old, whatever it is, it's got a number, it's 23. Um, you, so you're like, are you, you ju- are you just fresh out of college? Like, did you finish college, right? Recently, I think? Yep, yep, 2019. I was very, very thankful <laughs> to graduate 2019 and not this past year. Oh, yeah. So you actually got to like physically walk and get a diploma and yep, got, go to classes yep, in a classroom and all that, right? <laughs> yep, all that good stuff that it's going to be uh, probably not going to be happening for a while for the current grad. For the yeah, current for real. Students. So you're so obviously you're, you're young. Let's at least say you're very young to have already had a business for several years that's doing, you know, a, a healthy multiple six figure business like you're very young for that. So, so can you kind of walk us through the story? You know, when did it start? When, first of all, when did you, when did you first go, okay, I got to do something other than just get my degree and go get a job? Well, you see about five years ago, I've been working a job and within that job, I was making $7 and three cents an hour. And I, and I realized that $7 and three cents an hour, that just wasn't going to cut it. I was like, I got to figure out a better way. And I remember this searching online through the power of the internet. And I came across a book and basically the book outlined the differences between the lower middle and upper class. And one of those differences in the upper class is that they had gone out and started a business. And I thought back to myself, well, I've gone door to door lemonade selling. I bought and sold baseball cards, mowed lawns, like basically anything that I could do to go out there and make money on my own. And then it was like sort of that aha moment. I was like, wow, there's actually a name to it called entrepreneurship. There's tons of people that are interested in it. And just from that sort of aha moment, I was like, wow, I got to read as much as I possibly can on the subject of entrepreneurship. So that's why I found, you know, Think and Grow Rich, the Entrepreneur Roller Coaster with Darren Hardy, you know, Brian Tracy, Jim Rohn, and just started just devouring all those entrepreneurship books before I ever went out there and started a business. And that sort of first step I, I took was I found out a site called Alibaba and AliExpress. And for those of you listening who might not know, basically it allows you to import products directly from China. So I purchased about 50 phone cases from China for $80, sold those on eBay. But I quickly learned that sometimes if you buy name brand products from China, they're going to be knockoffs, um, which they were. So I got, I got all those sent back to me from my eBay buyers, refunding them their money, made great, great Christmas gifts that year, uh, luckily. But I just, I knew that the power of sourcing from China was going to be a great opportunity. So then I went off and started another company importing bracelets and watches from China bought them for about $2 a piece, sell them for $20 a piece, built the brand that way, used Instagram influencers to market the company. I would just send them the product for free. And in return, they would promote my product for free. And it was a good gig. Um, it was cold in Massachusetts at the time. I would go, I would basically ship the thing, ship the products out of my dorm room. I would put them in a little mailer. I would probably walk half a mile down the street um, to the local post office and, and mail them there, which was very cold. Uh, in the uh, middle of January, especially around Christmas time and December. And I realized that I kind of just wanted to do something else. And I just wanted to go out there, motivate individuals, inspire individuals. So I started a company called Become the Lion. It grew like super quickly, uh, 600,000 followers in the first year. At the time, I was a host of a podcast. We had a blog, courses, books. But what I really realized with that company is that people love motivational content. They love to be pumped up the like, share, comment on that all day long. But when it actually comes to taking action in their life, it just, it just doesn't happen. And just after about two years of that company, I just felt like sort of just burnt out, wanted to take a step on the sidelines and just started just freelancing myself out there. Just, you know, seeing what I could do with some of the skills I learned, which was blog writing, editing podcasts. And I came across someone that wanted to get booked on podcasts. And I was like, you know, I book guests on my show and I got to interview some super cool individuals like Mike Dillard, John Lee Dumas, Chris Ducker, um, Brian Stuman, Dan Locke. So I had some good experience of booking guests on my show. I figured how hard could it be to book her on shows? 
worked with her, picked up some other freelancing clients. And then eventually I became, you know, I don't want to say super good at it, became decent at it, started to get some referrals and then hired my first employee. I was like, wow, like, you know, I spent pretty much the last six months to a year doing all this. Now I can have an employee do it where I don't necessarily have to be pitching my clients, but I'm still able to make money. I was like, wow, this is, this is a pretty cool gig. And then over time, you know, just being able to expand it um, to about five employees now where they handle all the booking agents and I'm more that, that CEO role or I look over the processes and then go out there um, and help to promote the company. And I like to share that story because I think people think of entrepreneurship as a very linear line where it's just like you go from, I want to go start a business to, I want to start making six figures. And I think with at least myself, it's just like, you know, the phone cases led me to the importing the bracelets and the bracelets led me to wanting to go out there and inspire people to start a business. And that company inspired me to go start freelancing and the freelancing started, you know, inspired me to start podcasting you. And I think it's just over time, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs just expect it to happen overnight. And it really took me a good five years until I started making six figures in my business. And I think a lot of the times entrepreneurs get lost in that thought where they just want it overnight. And then, cause you go on Instagram and you see people with these cars and these watches and these clothes. And they're just like, I want that right now, but it's just not going to happen right now. It's going to take that work. And I think a lot of people give up because it does take a lot of work. Yeah. It's so, I mean, it's so true. You're talking about the, the winding road and, and I think it's, it's awesome that, uh, and everybody's hearing this, you're hearing it from 23 year old Trevor that it doesn't happen overnight. It's kind of funny because everybody's like, well, geez, I'm, I'm 69 and it hasn't <laughs> happened for me. This guy's 23. But the point is, it doesn't matter if you're 69 or 49 or 29 or 23 or 18 or seven. I mean, I know, uh, you know, gosh, when I was at Funnel Hacking Live earlier this year, I met like um, Caleb Maddox and God, there was this one other kid that Russell had on stage who was like, ele- he was like 11 or 12 and he had a agency that does like six, six figures and like fun- built, he builds funnels for, you know, like mature business clients. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter when you start, but it is crazy. What you're describing is so true that like those first few years, people don't, they don't make it. The washout rate is so high in, uh, in, and I mean, I don't know any entrepreneur who made it in whatever it is. I don't know anybody where it happened in less than, I don't know, two or two to five years. Oh, I know. And, yet, and yet people wash out so fast. So like you're so young, how did you not get discouraged? Because the stereotype would say that, well, like young people are impetuous and they want immediate gratification and they aren't patient. So like what made you any different? I think the biggest thing for me was one, the self-development and opening up the world to entrepreneurship that I realized that I could go out there and make an income on my own. If I work eight hours today, or if I work two hours today, I control my own income and I just never wanted to have that ceiling where someone could say, all right, you're going to work 40 hours a week. We're going to pay you 60,000. If you work 60 hours a week, you're still getting paid 60,000. You're not getting overtime. And I was like, wow, you know, I definitely don't want that. I don't want to have that sort of cap on my income. And then two, I think just over time reading books and in personal development, I realized I don't want to just be wasting time. I don't want to just be sitting there every night after work and after classes and just watch three, four hours of Netflix, just internally, I just couldn't stomach that. And I was like, no matter what, if you're going to podcast you for whatever reason, you know, people will stop listening to podcasts. I would go out there and start another business. For me, it's always just like, I just, within myself, I can't just sit there and not do anything to go out there and improve upon myself. And I think that going from these different businesses, I could just never sit on the sidelines. I always just had to be going out there and making money for myself. And like I mentioned earlier, I could go back to when I was going door to door lemonade selling and, and buying and selling baseball cards for me. It's always just going out there and making money on my own. I would just never want someone to, you know, you can only get paid twice a month and that's going to be it. There's no way that you can change it. So it's for me, it's just like, I don't know if it's that scarcity or being scared of just having that sort of chains on my ankle. For me, it's just always being able to go out there and do it myself and never have that cap. And it's always just been a big proponent in my life. Yeah. You know, there seems to be kind of a restless, quality about you know there's there's some people that I think they they're like well I want to become an entrepreneur to solve a problem in my life like I lost my job and I need to make money or something and they're like nobody's hiring so I'll become an entrepreneur right like it's a very like pragmatic decision but I think more often and more likely to succeed are those people where it's like it's Joe it's just so innate to who you are and how you are I mean like snakes slither they don't walk like 
frogs hop, they don't walk. You know, like uh, certain creatures have a certain way that they, they simply move through space. Entrepreneurs, good ones at least, seem to have like almost like a restlessness, like a perpetual dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. yeah, I at least I know that's me and I know of so many of the guests that I've, I've interviewed, they describe it that same way because what, you're, what you described as like so off-putting to you, which is like, I get paid twice a month. I, you know, it doesn't really matter so much what I do, then no, it's going to be what it's going to be. Um, I, you know, I don't, I, I, get, I don't like downtime. I want, you know, that's actually what some people are like, what is he talking about? That's amazing. You mean you get paid twice a month, no matter what you do. And you have all this other time that you don't have to work. You can just chill and play video games or something. So, so how, what, what do you think it's nature, nurture? Was it an early influence? Are you just like, you know, out of your mind? Like, what's the deal? Why are you so dissatisfied? Why can't you just be happy? Like, like most people seem to want to be. I think just the reason is just looking at most people and just realizing that they're generally not going to be happy with their life. And a lot of the times that stems back to more often than not, it's just, it's going to be money problems. And the reason that they're not generating more money in their life is either a, they lack the skills, which they could probably learn through self-development over time, or it's B, they're not going out there and starting a business and they're going and working for someone else and allowing themselves to dictate their income. And I think that's just a big thing for me. It's just that money component and just, and just seeing like what I can do with it. As an example, I graduated college and I owed stupidly $90,000 in student loans. But I know that through having my business, I started paying last October and either today or tomorrow, I'll, act I'll actually be able to make my final payment. And I'll have been able to pay off that entire loan amount in one year. And I see a lot of people, you know, having great amount of student loans and the reason that they're not able to pay it off is because they're not able to create a, a high income for themselves and I think they complain they say oh it's the government's fault and it was a big reality for me where I had to look myself in the face be like this $90,000 isn't going away I'm paying $10 a day in interest it's going to be 300 bucks a month it's not going to go down I have to figure out a way to get through this and that all stemmed back to having more money but also having more money, it also meant I had to provide a greater quality of service to my clients because if I provided a terrible quality of service, they were going to refund their money. They weren't going to work with me. So I think it's just a mixture of, of just having that. I think the biggest thing for me is just having that money and just having feeling safe and secure that knowing that, you know, I have that money there. I'm not going to go broke. I'm not going to have to go and work for someone else because if you don't have any money and you go out there and start your own business, <laughs> it's going to be significantly hard than if you do have money in the bank and you are able to take that risk. And I, I probably wouldn't recommend anyone to go out there and start their own business if they have zero dollars in the bank account. I just think that's sort of too much pressure that they're going to be putting on themselves to succeed. And hey, you know, it might work for some people, but I know for me personally, that's probably not the place I'd want to be. I think your clients, at least in a service-based business, they're probably going to sense that you need that money, where if you come from a yeah. place of relaxation, it's going to be a little bit better, better. And I find that when I go on client calls now, you know, obviously I want to work with the client, but if he does decide not to work with me, I'm like, that's okay. I have another client call coming the next day. I know that, you know, that person might sign up with me. So it's coming from a place of, you know, of abundance instead of sort of coming through that scarcity mindset. So first of all, I want to make sure we don't, uh, we don't lose the, the soundbite moment. If, if we were on Brad Lee's show, this is when we would drop a bomb. Like you're 23 years old. You're about to make your final student debt payment on a $90,000 uh, student debt. You went to Dartmouth. Uh, yep, uh, UMass Dartmouth. I'm, UMass Dartmouth. Okay. I wish it was Dartmouth. <laughs> so, no, okay, it's, it's UMass Dartmouth. Hey, you know what? I'm I'm from Texas and I live in Utah. It's all Dartmouth to me. <laughs> um, so ninety thousand dollar student debt, and you paid it off in a year without yeah. getting a job. So by the way, when you do start going back on podcasts, I mean, there's your story. How I oh. paid off my my ninety thousand dollar student debt in one year without getting a job. Right. Exactly. exactly. I mean, I and it's, and it's by starting a business and it doesn't really, anyway, I mean that, that, that probably, I don't need to tell you what your podcasting tagline is going to be, but that's just awesome. I mean, if, if people hear that, I hope everybody really heard that. How many 35, 40, 45 year olds are listening to this right now, still making monthly payments from that, that receipt you got after four years called a diploma and this guy paid it off in a year, 90 grand. I mean, that's powerful. So, 
Okay, so what? So you stopped going on podcast. So what were you going on podcast? What was kind of like your podcast shtick before? Because it was before you obviously were where you are now. What were you going on and talking about? So before I was just going on and talking about become the lion and just going on and, and talking about how to you know build a brand, how to grow a following. At that time, I thought it was you no. Know, it was super cool teaching people how they can grow to, let's say, 100,000 followers in the first year using Instagram. And then I quickly, re- not, I don't know, say quickly realized, but after a couple months, I was like, I'm teaching people how to do this, but the way that we're doing it, it's, it's not generating enough income. We're, you know, pretty much breaking even, maybe breaking a little bit beyond. You know, I realized that even though you have a following on Instagram of 100,000 followers, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be making six figures a year and that. I think that's an eye opener to people where you see these people on Instagram that have hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram and you automatically look up to them that you think that they're making money. And you know, and that might not be the truth. I know on my Instagram right now, I, I probably have like 900 followers and you know, I'm able to go out there and start a successful business where I think a lot of people think that they might need hundreds of thousands of followers. But if you do have a good business, you know, I don't think you need, you know, obviously you want to have a couple thousand on your business, but you don't need to go out there and have hundreds of thousands to actually start a successful company. Wait, wait, hold on, man. Hold on. Are you telling me that just because somebody has hundreds of thousands of Instagram followers, that doesn't mean that they're rich. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're baller. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. What? <laughs> no, dude, I think you go ahead. Yeah. I mean, them. it's, I'm being, I'm being coy, but like it's people literally think that they think that like, however many followers is, is how many dollars you have in the bank. Trust me, world, ain't, it ain't that way. Exactly. And you can think of, you know, how many Instagram influencers that are out there, you know, that let's say they don't have a business, they're getting, you know, paid to promote people's products. And, you know, I think the average income for an influencer is like 30, 35,000. And those are the ones that have 100,000 plus followers. Yeah, per, where, per year, to be clear. Yeah, per, yeah, per year, not per month or per week. Per, yeah, I'm, per I hear that. I'm like, well, is that, are they doing that daily or weekly? But like, no, you're talking about per year. Yep. So that, and that's like a pretty crazy stat where I think sometimes that information can be a little, a little bit misleading. You know, if you see an entrepreneur that has, you know, 50,000 or a hundred thousand followers, you could be like, Oh, they're super successful. But you know, maybe if you go out and check interviews that they've done or, you know, listen to their videos, is it exactly what they're talking about? Have they actually gone out there and gone through the battlefield and started a successful business? Or are they just spewing sort of motivational content? Like my company was, you know, you know, we're sort of growing the company, you know, telling people to start a business as we were building a business. And, you know, it, it worked to a certain degree, but I don't think I was at that level maturity wise where I could go out there and coach people how to start a business where I feel as though now I could look at most online concepts and teach people, you know, yes, you want to start with an email list. You want to, you know, you want to do this. This is how you want to set up your calls, your team, and then, and then so on. I think that just having these 50,000 followers and 100,000 followers doesn't necessarily mean that the person's successful. So sometimes you might have to do a little bit more deep uh, of a background check on them. Yeah, that, it's so funny. When I, I started running um, for my business, I started running, I guess we started running Instagram ads. And Instagram's the worst. I don't really mm-hmm. get this on YouTube, although you don't, you don't actually get comments on your ads on YouTube because they play on other people's videos. But like Facebook ads, I get comments tell, of people telling me that I'm you know, an idiot or an asshole or a liar or whatever, but they never make this, they never tie it to like my following on Mm. Instagram though. I used to get, when I started running ads, it's been less than a year since I've run Instagram ads. And when I started running Instagram ads, I had like 3000 followers and I, and it was super low engagement because you know, I don't care. I'll tell you three, most of those 3000 I got through some crappy service that I paid like $200 a month for that went out and did follow unfollow and, you know, actually there were probably like 600 legitimate followers and like 2,400 garbage followers. So I had super low engagement. Instagram didn't show my content for crap. And I start running ads and I literally every single hour people would comment and go, Oh, if you're so successful, why do you only have 3000 followers? Oh mm-hmm. yeah. You're such a big shot. That must be why 3000 people are listening to you. Like, and, and it, and it, it, it didn't change me. Like I, I'm, I'm, I am where I am. Like my, my, my life is my life, but I look at people and I'm like, these people are delusional, but yet it happens so often. I actually, it, you know, it taught me about the world we live in. That's literally people's filter. People's currency is following. It's likes, comments, shares, follows as if, as if you can somehow package those and send them to the utility company to pay a power bill or something. 
exactly. It's just, I think it just amazes me that people, you know, especially I'll see on Dave Ramsey, for example. So I follow his page on Instagram and people yeah. will go out there similar to myself. Well, they'll say I paid off hundred thousand loans in an 18 month period. And then you'll, you'll read the comments and people will be like, I don't get how anyone could do that. That's so stupid, you know, and there, there's very negative. I'm like, how is anyone going to be successful if they're super negative about a business? And again, I think it comes from that scarcity mindset where they don't believe in themselves that they can go out there and start a successful business. So they don't think it's possible for others to go out there and do that. And especially, you know, Jeff, when they see your Instagram and it has 3000 followers, they're like, well, Shouldn't someone that has 10,000 followers and above, those are the only people that can go out there and start a successful business. I don't get how he can have 3,000 followers and do it. It doesn't make sense. So therefore, he can't be successful. He can't go out there and sell millions and millions of dollars worth of his product or service. It's just not possible. And I think, I don't know if it's the way the generation is growing up and they just see that you have to have a large Instagram following or I think there's just a disconnect somewhere there along the line. Yeah, I mean, I'll share. So, I mean, here this will really blow people's minds. I made money on the internet, not like, not like I was washing cars down the street. I had an online digital business, multiple digital businesses, made a you know, really good money online for 10 years with no Instagram. Mm. I didn't even have an Instagram. Like, what? I, there's no such thing as the internet without Instagram. Trust me, there's a really big internet out there and a whole lot of business happening and it's not all on Instagram. In fact, to your point, the, the amount of business relative to the amount of attention on Instagram is actually very, very low. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know people who have three, four, five million followers and, and they have, I would say they have a, a nice middle-class income. They make about as much money as my local, you know, bankruptcy attorney who has like 17 followers <laughs> that are like his family. You know, it, it, anyway, it's really, I think it's really important for people to realize like the, the core concept is about value. What do you have to offer? You, you can make, and there's some actually really good courses out there about like how to make six figures with less than 10,000 Instagram or less than 10,000 person audience where the value of what you are, I mean, to you, like, like you, for example, your average I don't know your business. I don't want to ask you to air all the inner workings of your business, but I know that I have two people that help book me on shows now and between the two of them and, and one of them admittedly does some other kind of growth hacking services for us. But, but I mean, between the two of them, I pay six figures a year. So you don't have to have for a service like yours where you're helping people build their brand or build their audience. I mean, I, I got to imagine how many clients do you have? Can I ask that? Like how many active clients are you working with right now? I'm guessing it's less than 10. No, so it's actually a little bit more. So we generally work with anywhere between 30 to 40 clients at oh, wow. any given okay. time. And, and I think, you know, something I wanted to mention too is people think you have to go out there and do ads on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. And honestly, the, the biggest reason for our success has been primarily just doing cold email marketing. I hired um, an assistant from the Philippines. I, you know, honestly, I pay her $5 an hour. She sends out a hundred emails a week, a week. So she works 20 hours a week for me. And basically she just goes to podcasts and says, you know, she'll go to bigger pockets podcast and she'll say, you know, as a, in a nutshell, she'll say, Hey, so-and-so I saw that you're a guest on this show. If you, you know, my comp our, our company, you know, helps others book, um, other real estate investors on podcasts. If you're interested in our services, book a call with me and, you know, out of probably a hundred emails, you know, it's not a great conversion rate, but we'll probably get five people to schedule a call. So you can think about that's 20 calls a month. And then if I close about three of those, well, I know that our packages are between 3000 to 5000 So right there, that's going to be about 9000 to 15000 a new income coming in for the month, plus the additional clients that we have. And it's not something that's sexy. It's not something that, you know, is new and bold. We don't have an agency doing that. I just have that one assistant helping me out from the Philippines and, and she does an excellent job. And that's really how I've been able to grow the company over the last year. So and I think people think that they have to go out there and do all this Facebook marketing, all this Instagram marketing where, you know, for for 400 bucks a month, I'm, I'm getting an excellent return, you know, on basically the work that she's doing for us. So I think people can get misconstrued and thinking that, you know, it's going to be super hard to market your services or cold email marketing doesn't work. But if you do have a good service to provide and you have a website, you know, to schedule a call with the person, you know, some people, you know, they hop on a call with me and they're not that interested at all. And I can tell right away other people are interested in, and I'm not trying to sell them that service right away. I want to make sure that it's a fit for them. But I think, you know, it's been an excellent marketing strategy for us. And, you know, outside of the $400 in the beginning, 
I was doing it myself. I was sending these cold emails myself. I wasn't paying her, especially in the first year when I was just trying to get new clients. And, you know, it's a free marketing service. I wasn't putting any money on Facebook or Instagram. So if someone's going out there and starting their own business and they don't necessarily have marketing budget to go out there, just do something like cold email marketing, find those in your space, you know, craft a, an email that's four to six sentences, put some good call to actions, you know, even put a, a case study link in there if you have it at that time and just see where it rolls. And, you know, it doesn't have to be sexy. And I think people think everything about an entrepreneurship has to be sexy. And I don't think it really has to be that way. No, that's, you just described the Instagram illusion slash fallacy slash bullshit in a single statement, which is people think that entrepreneurship is sexy. That's the problem is Instagram's way too sexy to be legitimate entrepreneurship most of the time. It's more, you know, nuts and bolts, nitty gritty. It's like farming. Like your hand, you always got like cuts on your fingers and like dirt in your hair and you get the work done. You plant, you reap, you grow, you prosper and, and you compound over time. It's literally the law of the farm, right? So I think it's really important. There have been some really key takeaways that I hope people are getting from this. The, the de-emphasis on big, sexy, whatever, but especially within advertising. Um, Facebook, Instagram, even YouTube ads, like these are incredibly powerful modalities once you have a really proven offer with a really great basic business model that's proven itself out, not just in terms of being able to sell it, being able to fulfill it, being able to support it, being able to make people happy with it over a long period of time, and being able to weather a lot of variation. Because I mean, I'll, I will personally say that four days ago, uh, well, this past week, it's Wednesday on the day we're shooting this, this past weekend, we, re we, we finally sat down and did the analysis and realized the extent to which over the last 30 days that we felt the brunt of the elections on the cost of our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube ads, our costs have gone up like 40% in the last 30 days because I guess it's election time, right? Like, so if you might be running a business and go, well, man, if I could just acquire a customer for $80, I'd be gold. Okay, well, you might go online and, and figure out that you can acquire that customer for $80 today, but what about when it's a month before Black Friday? Mm. And the volume of advertising on those platforms goes up by 50%, and that's in a non-election year. And now your $80 customer just turned into a $130 customer. Are you going to go out of business? Do you have a quarter million dollars in the bank to weather the storm? Because as soon as you get through that, then you're going to drop off into December and you're going to have crap sales through the end of the year because people just spent all their money on holiday gifts and travel. Like, you know, I mean, right? Like it's not as, the, the, or get, you know, because here's the deal. Your VA in the Philippines, she's never going to call you and be like, yeah, my costs went up 40% this week. Mm -hmm, exactly. Right? For, like I know you've been used to paying me 400, but I'm going to go ahead and need 700 this week because, you know. Like that never happens. It's it, the unsexy stuff is actually way more stable. And you say it's not sexy, but paying off $90,000 of student debt in one year, that's sexy. Exactly. And I think like even my business, all I'm doing is providing a service that, you know, in the beginning, I didn't really think that was that interesting, but people thought it was interesting. They provide, you know, they were willing to pay for it. I found out over time that I was good at it. And it sort of just morphed into this, into this thing where I think people going out there and starting a business, they're like, I'm interested in this subject. I want to go out there and start a business. And the marketplace is going to tell you whether that's going to be successful or not. Yeah. The marketplace told me that, wow, you know, these individuals want to go get booked on podcasts. And then from there, I was like, wow, you know, really on real estate investors want to get booked on podcasts where health coaches, you know, not necessarily want to get booked on podcasts. And we can tell that from the cold email, if we're sending out 400 emails a month and we're getting 20 calls from real estate investors where we're getting three calls from health coaches. Well, health coaches aren't going to be that interested in it. And then just adapting that sort of, I guess, just over time. And I think just looking at your numbers, as you mentioned, like your Facebook ads going up so much in cost, and that's something that you'd be able to track and then look at. And I think too, as an entrepreneur, if you're not tracking your costs um, and looking at your KPIs pretty much on a week, daily, even weekly basis, you're going to be uh, pretty lost there. Well, and I think what you just said is a really illustrative example of like, there are no accidents there are no this is what I, what I love about capitalism and money is it cuts out all the fluff nothing happens 
in when it comes to like doing a thing to make money that doesn't have an, an explanation in the behavior of rationally self-interested people. So to your point, health coaches, not as interested in being on podcasts, real estate investors, more interested in being on podcasts. I would say, and you probably would agree with me now with the more mature, more experienced version of you, you probably could have anticipated that and shortened the curve to get into success by knowing, hey, we should target this, not that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna float my theory as to why that is. It's because health coaches, first of all, uh, my experience of real estate investors, one of the big reasons they love putting themselves out there is because they're actually, they're trying to raise money. Mm -hmm. They wanna be listened to by people and they know that podcast audiences are fairly affluent, a lot of them are successful, and that if they hear a real estate investor, and by the way, real estate investing is, low, is geographically neutral. You can hear, like I've done a couple interviews. I did one with a great guy in Atlanta, one with a great guy in Houston. And both of them, I was like, dude, stay in touch. Send me deals. Like I'll, I'll, give, I'll invest in one of your deals if I like it. Like they're trying to grow that network and, they, and podcasting is really effective for them. Whereas health coaches, A, it's, it's a service that... Uh, you know, it's just qualitatively different in a lot of ways. It is more location-based, you know, I guess technically maybe with, with Corona or COVID, it's changed a little bit. But I mean, theoretically, if you're going to hire a health coach, you probably want to work with somebody in your town, right? And so it's not as valuable for them to go on a podcast and expand their audience to potential customers in a lot of, so, and it's a lower price service. It's a lower ROI, you know, a real estate investor gets one mm -hmm. good listener it could be worth a million dollars to them. That's not so true for a health coach, right? So like, again, there's always an explanation based on oh. economics and, and a lot of entrepreneurship is just getting good at understanding how the world works so that you can at least come up with reasonable theories that can drive your choices and decisions without having to trial and error everything, right? Exactly. And I think if I could go back there and start my business, number one thing I would target would have to be the affluent individuals, especially real estate investors, where I know they're going to have a high net worth, where they're probably going to have that income, where they could invest in my business, where they know that, like, as you mentioned, one listener, that could be generate, you know, let's say if they're raising a syndication fund, and they get one to 2% on that acquisition fee, they could, you know, end up making twenty, thirty thousand $30,000. So if they do a $3,000 investment with my company, you know, what is that? Uh, you know, a very, I can't do the quick math, but a very good return right. on their money. And I think you know, sometimes if people are going out there and targeting a business where health coaches, you know, typically they're not probably not going to be as affluent where another category we go into is we work with a lot of business coaches and we find that business coaches are individuals who have started a successful business. They're typically going to be more affluent. I think that again, if someone's going out there and starting a business, you know, do the people that you're selling your product or service to, are they going to have that money to purchase your product? or service too. Because when we raised our prices to what they are now, I hopped on a lot of phone calls with people in the before would have been able to afford our services, but can no longer afford our services. And that was a good thing for us because instead of having say 75 clients paying a lower price, now we have, you know, 40 clients paying a higher price, but they're going to be a lot more enjoyable to work with. And I find that people that pay a lower cost for your service are generally going to be the people that are going to be more annoying <laughs> in a sense where if they have problems, they're going to reach out to you first, you know, and so I realized that, you know, charging a higher price of service, people are going to take your company more seriously. They're going to see you more seriously than if I went out and said, Hey, I'm going to charge a hundred dollars per podcast. I book you on, which is honestly what we did in the beginning. And I realized that people wouldn't value our services. They would get booked on three podcasts and then disappear, or we would get them all ready to go out. And then they would never respond to our email. Yet I noticed when I started charging 3000 for a podcast package, you know, people, people would respond to my email. People would book themselves on shows and they wouldn't disappear. And I think by having, you know, and someone investing more money with your company, they're going to be more responsive to you. Where if someone's only putting a hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars, you know, I think there's a greater chance of them disappearing. Man. I mean, you just, you just stepped into such a, a, a huge subject for people that I don't think I can ever have the conversation enough times, which is raise your prices. Mm -hmm. Got problems, raise your prices. I mean, unless your problem is that you suck at what you do, in which case raise your value, <laughs> but got, pro got customer service problems, got refund problems, got chargeback problems, got uh, bad economics problems, got profitability problems, raise your prices, 
and then do whatever you have to do to be good enough to be worth those higher prices. Exactly. And for us, raising our prices has attracted better quality of clients. And by attracting better quality clients, they give us better referrals. And I can give you an example. We took on a client, Matthew Pollard. He's a best-selling author of a book called The Introvert's Edge. He basically teaches introverts how to go out there and sell. Well, he was good friends with Jordan Harbinger. We did good work for Matthew. And then now he referred Jordan Harbinger to us. And, you know, for those of you listening, Jordan Harbinger has a super successful podcast out there. I think it's in the top 10 in self-improvement. He was interviewed Kobe Bryant, Howie Mandel, Russell Brand. And then all of a sudden, now we're being associated with Jordan. And then now my expectation is we're going to do an excellent job for Jordan where now he's going to refer his clients and his inner circle to us. And it just grows over time. But if we were probably charging Matthew a hundred dollars at that time, he probably wouldn't look at us as a good quality service. He'd be saying that's just too cheap. And then he would go and work with our competitor and then he would refer Jordan to one of our competitors. And I think when people underprice themselves, people aren't going to see the value in it and they're not going to see that you're going to do an excellent job where if you do charge that higher price, yes, people are going to have higher expectations for you. But I think those higher expectations, it's a good thing because you should have high expectations of your business and of your product yeah. and service. You don't want to go out there and provide a shitty quality and have people, you know, not renewing, you know, year after year or even month after month. You know, you want to go out there and make sure that you're doing an excellent job for them regardless of your price. But having that higher price point, it's going to allow you to sleep a little bit better at night. Well, yeah. And if, and if, if, you're, if there's anything you can do in your business that's going to create a customer with a higher expectation of you than you already have of yourself, you have a bigger problem. Like there's, I, I wake up every morning knowing what I expect of myself and I'm, I'm pretty solid in saying, I don't think anybody expects any more out of me than I already do. Like that's how you gotta be as an entrepreneur. Cause if you're not going to be the best, you're just going to get steamrolled like everyone else. Right. And, and by the way, I gotta say, if anybody wants to see how business gets done, uh, business just got done because Trevor, we're going to be talking after this show. And, and I want to make sure I get both Matthew and Jordan on this show, since that is a service you provide for them, right? <laughs> yep. Um, but anyway, uh, so <laughs> cool. See how I just kind of like sque squeeze that in there, <laughs> exactly. right? Um, but yeah, man, I, you know, so, so I have one more question, but first I'm just going to in inject something that I just need to say. Like, way to fucking go, man. You're 23 years Thank old. You. You got a six figure business. You're about to wipe out your student debt. You got big name clients. Like, I hope everybody listening is like seeing how doable it is, not how easy it is, how doable it is. And it's doable if you just trust the, that's the biggest thing. When I heard you talking about it, about how you started here and then you ended up here and then you bounced over here and you, you twisted over here, but you didn't bail because you trusted that that road would eventually wind to a happy place. And that, that ability to trust the entrepreneurial process is what I see is the undoing of so many people because you can't tell somebody what it's gonna look like when they succeed. You can't, I don't care how good a coach or mentor you are. I couldn't, I couldn't nobody could come to me and say, Jeff, if you just show me what it's gonna look like when I arrive, then I'll go there as fast as I can. I can't tell you. I can just tell you some stuff to start doing, to start building the muscles and stretching the fibers and eventually, you know, you're going to get there. So, so good job on that. Now, the, here's the question I, I said I had. How does somebody know when they're ready to go, I'll say, put themselves out there, whether that's get on a podcast or even maybe it's create a course or write a book or I mean, do you get people coming to you going, well, I, I, I think I want to do this, but before we talk about your packages, can you help me know if I'm even ready? I think the biggest thing is just getting feedback from your customers. Once you see that feedback and you can usually I'll determine that in the form of testimonials. Once I started getting 10, 20 testimonials from my clients, I understood that, wow, we're like people are actually providing, you know, love my product and service. They're willing enough to give me a testimonial. Then I kind of knew that, I have information that could go out there and be shared because they're seeing the value of my company. So I think once you start to get those testimonials in your company, and that can be a little bit daunting in the beginning if you've never done it, but just, well, I did go on Google, type in testimonial template, see what's on, see what, see what was out there, copy and paste it, change it a little <laughs> bit. Probably, probably recommend if you've had a client or even a customer for say three or four months and they're continuing to work with you, 
I've, I usually determine that's going to be a good time frame, whether you could ask them for a testimonial. And then once they give that to you, you ask the next one. And then once you get, you know, around five to 10, you're like, wow, this actually works. People are finding value in this. I'm sure that there's podcast audiences out there that would find value in this as well. So I think that's a good mark to really determine whether, you know, you're not, you're ready to go out there and start sharing your message on podcasts. So obviously if somebody, for somebody to have, you know, customer or client testimonials and they would need to have customers or clients <laughs> as a prerequisite. So, so you're saying that at least part of the readiness is that, and I, I mean, this seems like it should be a given, but at the same time, I, you know, so people, and I, and I try to be empathetic. Like some people are at a place in their life where just having a big idea is such an accomplishment for them because maybe they've grown up mm -hmm. under such sort of psychological and creative suppression that they're like, Hey, I got an idea. I, I could become a ketogenic diet coach or, or whatever, you know, whatever it is. And that feels like such a breakthrough for them that they're like, man, I need to go on podcasts and tell everybody what I just realized. And it's like, yes, but let's help somebody first. Right? Like to your point, and, and it doesn't even need to be like successful client testimonials per se, depending on what the, the bit, the, the bitch, the niche or the angle, sorry, the niche or the angle is. It, but it, it should be, there should be some evidence that what you offer actually can help people. Because if, can't, if, if there's no evidence of that, how is a podcast host supposed to know that it can help their audience, right? I think like even if you have like an e-commerce business, you know, potentially you're not, you're not getting customer reviews where if, when I was selling products and bracelets, when I knew that I was selling, you know, 100 or 200 bracelets a month, if I probably got to selling 1,000 bracelets per month, then I knew that one, I've gone out there, I started a brand on Instagram. Two, I've worked with influencers. Three, built a website. And then four, you know, marketed, shipped it well, figured out something well that I could go out there and go on a podcast and say how to, you know, sell your first thousand products per month. And I could go through my exact story where, again, you don't typically need customer testimonials or feedback, but you know that if your product, is, if your, I should say your product, a lot of people are buying it, then that's a good idea that you found something and that your story needs to go out there and it needs to be heard by these podcast audience because typically there's going to be someone in the audience who's going out there and just starting a business on their own for the very first time. And just by listening to you, they might have that aha moment within themselves where they can take it back and sort of leapfrog themselves when going out there and starting their own business. Yeah. And I think if somebody's coming at it from the business angle, you know, business podcasts, marketing, entrepreneurship, and so forth, um, it, it is really important to realize nobody, actually nobody cares about your business. They just really care. If you have a story, mm -hmm. they care about your story. And if you don't have a story, it's, it could be because you don't have a story or it could be because you haven't figured out how to tell your story or you haven't even figured out what your story is because you're so, a lot of entrepreneurs are so focused on their business that their story is, I just broke a hundred grand in revenue. That's not your, that's your business's whatever benchmark of the day. That's not your story. Some business owners just haven't figured out who they are and what their actual story is. And I found that it can be hugely empowering and, and almost like life changing, like therapy in a way for people to embrace the idea that they have a story and figure out how to tell it in a way that moves people. Um, Anyways, so man, this has been, this has been awesome. I, again, I, I think you're, you're really inspiring uh, for, for people to hear about. And I love that you shined a light on the Instagram fallacy <laughs> and, and uh, even we're a little self-deprecating about it. You know, this like becoming a lion, like, like we were, we were growing a lot of lions that were good at, they had big manes and they puffed up their chest, but <laughs> their bodies were like these withered little chihuahua bodies. You know, they weren't actually lions just because they had 100,000 followers. And so I, I, I love that you were pretty, uh, you know, transparent about that. Um, how can people go get more of this goodness into your world? Let's, you mentioned your Instagram following kind of laughing. Let's, let's bump that up. How can people go find you? Sure. So they can check out um, Instagram, just Trevor Oldham. That's just the Instagram name. And then, you know, interested in getting booked on podcasts, they can just visit our website. That's just podcastingyou.com and it's just podcastingyou.com. Um, cool. Cool. Yeah. I mean, and, that, and it really is a, a, a huge service and to sum all that up, I guess what I would encourage people to kind of observe is like, it's like you said, it, it wasn't necessarily where you saw yourself going. You didn't know it ahead of time, but through your journey, you, you, your experience was, this is the thing that I can do 
that gives the most valuable to people that are willing to pay for great value Mm -hmm. or that gives the most value to people that are willing to pay for value. Right. And so if people can get really good at looking at their environment through that filter, what can I give the most value in a way or or that would serve people who would be willing to pay for that value? Then you're going to land on your, your perfect business pretty quickly. Um, It's the, it's the, what am I interested in? What fulfills me? What do I think is cool? <laughs> what are my friends going to be impressed by? Like, what do my parents want me to do? Those are the questions that lead you down a million dead ends, right? Exactly. And I think, you know, people are saying, I want to do something that's fulfilling. And, you know, I, I love playing golf, but I'm not going to go out there and be a PGA professional. I, I couldn't go out there and make a business, you know, teaching people how to play golf. I just love playing it on the weekends. You know, it fulfills me but it's not making me money. And I think people get that confused where, you know, getting people booked on podcasts, is it the most fulfilling job in the world? You know, potentially not, but does it, but does it provide a good quality service? It does. Does it pay a good income and allow me to live the life that I want to live? It does. So it's a good fit. My, the marketplace told me, yep, we're going to pay you X amount of money. Yep. You know, we enjoy this. We enjoy your service. So we're just going to continue with it. And I think that's, you know, it's funny when you just mentioned that fulfilled that, you know, about being fulfilled, so many people want to go out there and start a business. I want to start a business that's going to fulfill me. And, you know, I think it's going to be a problem <laughs> because typically the marketplace is going to tell you whether it's fulfilling them. It doesn't really matter about you. Yeah. I mean, I go, I go into the office every morning now and I play piano for an hour and I play whatever. And I was a professional musician for a decade. I was very unfulfilled. I was very broke. I was very frustrated. I was very overworked. I was very tired. Um, I'm way more fulfilled by music now than I used to be because it's only fun. It's only always fun. And I only do it whenever, however I want to do it. So having money and having control over your time, I promise you'll be fulfilled. Like you said, it doesn't matter. Become a broker for dumpsters. Like Mm -hmm. every job site needs a dumpster. Be the guy that they call to go, yo, can I get a dumpster out here and pick it up in four days or, or we'll call you when it's full. Be that guy make 200 grand a year working from a cell phone and traveling and doing whatever you want. I promise you'll be fulfilled even though you work with dumpsters. Mm -hmm. Like, like to your point, it really doesn't matter. Um, Man, this has been great. Uh, You said podcasting you.com. Yep. Correct. Cool. Trevor, thanks for being a guest on millionaire secrets. I, uh, I've I've really enjoyed this. I'm going to have my kids listen to this. Honestly, I think, I think it's so cool. And again, I don't want to keep like harping on the youth thing, but like, Mm -hmm. it's cool, man. Like I, I, you know, I have teenagers. I, we, we, there's a lot of younger people at my house a lot. And I, I just don't think that many young people really see entrepreneurship and business as like an actual viable thing, which is really sad. And it's because it's mostly com- o- o- omitted from the educational system. Mm-hmm. I mean, you spent $90,000 on a college education. <laughs> Did anybody ever tell you maybe you can start a business? <laughs> They're not. That's sort of the, the way go through go through high school, go to college, and and then you know get a degree, go work a you know typically corporate job because those are the ones that are probably going to be paying a little bit higher, and work forty years, have a nice little retirement, you know potentially enjoy your life when you're sixty five or seventy, and you know call that a good life. And I know that's a that's a scary path to be working forty years for someone else that they can one dictate your income and two fire you at any time without cause. Yeah. You know, let's say the company's going down, they need to lay some people off. You're making a little bit too money. They need to trim the fat and boom, you're gone. You're searching for a new job. That's a, that's a little bit scary when your comes in the hand of someone else. Yeah. And, and I encourage anybody to go do the research on uh, job security, job turnover, salaries relative to student debt. How long does it actually take people to pay off their debt? Like go do the, the real research on employment and consumer economic, like consumer financial situations in the world. And I promise it's not that it's not that sexy. It's not as cool as they're, they're telling you. I, I interviewed a guy two days ago for a, a position with my company who it was the, it was the inverse. He helped his company grow from like 4 million a year to like 50 million a year. He did such a good job that the owner sold the company and he was out of a job. Mm. And, he, and, he, and here's the thing, growing the company a thousand percent, I'm sure he got bonuses, but it didn't make him earn a thousand percent more. It probably no. made him earn like 50% more because of bonuses and stuff. And then it cost him his job because they were able to sell the company. And now he's on the phone with me 
hoping I'll hire him. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I promise, man, at least consider the alternative. And, and again, thanks and, and props to you for being an example of what that looks like. Um, yeah, thank you. And this is a long, a long ending and wrap up of saying thank you. So thanks for being on Millionaire Secrets. And uh, thank you to the audience out there. I look forward to chatting on the next episode. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.